The Great War Western Front is a game I'm actively keeping my eyes on with its turn-based campaign and real-time battles. And last week, I was invited to play the campaign for almost three hours straight, learning the basics with the tutorial, handling the campaign on my own, and even playing another historical battle. This video will focus entirely on the campaign though, and much like the last event, I wasn't quite prepared for what I experienced. Today, we'll explore what the campaign entails, some unique mechanics that set the game up very well, and my overall opinion on the time I played. Let's dive into this exciting World War I RTS game, starting with the campaign map, most notably its regions and unique mechanics. While the basics are already out from previous videos, the nitty gritty is a bit more complex, and your campaign centers around hex grid regions along the Western Front. These regions are where you'll move your troops to fight in real-time battles, where you'll build up your supplies and either attack from or be attacked on. There's a bit more though. Your supplies determine pre-battle trench building and how many reinforcements you can call on during the battle. 12 battalions do not matter much in this game if you don't have the supplies to bring them all in, or consider a defensive battle and being unable to build a robust line of trenches to hold off the enemy troops. Supply is the most crucial resource in this game, at least by what I can tell so far, and it can definitely make or break your battles. Now it goes deeper. Each region has stars to note their importance. Stars can only be lost in a great victory, which is the highest level of winning you can achieve, and only when stars are lost is a region finally given over to the other side. However, stars are gained back should any region not come under attack in a turn, meaning that you'll either need to repeatedly attack a region each turn and win every time, or use multiple regions to attack within a single turn. That's simple enough if that's where it ended, but nope. Then you factor in different buildings that buff regions, faction effects, regional effects like fog, which limit the visibility in a battle, regional abilities like espionage to see the battalion composition of neighboring regions, and even battle fatigue, there's several mechanics all operating at once in every single region for you to consider when moving forces in or attacking or defending. And I'm not going to lie, it looked a bit mundane at first, but noting all of the things going on at once, I was much more satisfied with regions after I played. Of course your regions won't hold without troops, and that's where we see some pretty unique mechanics. One of the more important notes about your infantry is that they are not infinite. In fact, you cannot even recruit infantry soldiers at all. They will all appear in unknown amounts across your base regions or perhaps as rewards for completing objectives, and that number might even go up or down depending on national will. Regardless, the lack of infinite soldiers means you cannot reinforce every region with 100 battalions of soldiers to make an impenetrable wall. You'll have to put some strategical thought into where you want to use your soldiers to defend or perhaps a buildup next to a weakened region to send waves of men at a lightly defended area. You can, however, use your gold reserves to purchase tanks, aircrafts, and siege artillery to supplement your infantry, pending you have the correct tech unlocked. We'll circle to that in a minute. Back to infantry, one very unexpected mechanic that pertains to the allied powers is this unity of command where certain nationalities will have reduced morale when stacked together. There are three groups. First is Britain and its current or former colonies. Second is France and third, the US. Anytime battalions or companies of units from these three groups are together, it's bad news bears for that region. Furthermore, infantry units are not all built equally and have different nationality bonuses. Canadian infantry gain bonuses during a smoke or rolling barrage, French infantry cost less supply as reinforcements, and Belgian infantry have reduced morale modifiers overall. It's a seemingly small feature, but it can and does have an effect on your battles, as you're more willing to use Belgian infantry when storming an enemy trench line without arty support, or Canadian infantry when you do have support. Knowing when and how to use certain troops can make or break your battles without a doubt. Of course, it's not just about optimizing your infantry solely on the battlefield. Tech progression matters as well, and while the tech tree in the Great War Western Front isn't exactly revolutionary, it's a definite case of you won't hit every tech, so you'll need to be purposeful in what directions of the six different branches you decide to act on. You might be able to get to tanks earlier than history, but at the cost of having very weak infantry or having a lack of logistical buildings, for instance. 
And lastly, the battles themselves are rather unique in the RTS world, despite their obvious similarities to Total War and Ultimate General Civil War, especially the pre-battle scene. Being able to build up your own trench network is something I've not seen before, and as with every other part of this game, requires a balance depending on your supplies. Choosing to over-fortify might be wise as it keeps the enemy busy for much longer, but if you spend too many resources on pre-trenching, you won't have enough to adequately deploy your troops or use your artillery to soften up enemy lines. The coordination I mentioned in my last video was ever more apparent during my three hours of playing across multiple battles. You'll never win simply by throwing men at the enemy, and the more losses you have, the less of a victory is obtained, even if you wipe the enemy from the map. Remember that stars are only lost at the greatest victory type, and men lost plays a large factor in that determination. Pyrrhic victories won't get you far in this game. So utilizing your artillery to suppress fire moments before your men are within range is crucial to figure out. And while this certainly isn't a StarCraft level of clicks per minute, knowing how to fully use everything all at once is key. Now with all of that taken into effect, I'll briefly sum up my overall opinions on the event. I learned so much more about the game between the tutorial and actually playing the campaign. The Great War Western Front is so much more in depth than I thought it would be by the initial videos. The campaign map has so much to offer, with numerous strategies that can be used offensively or defensively. While I didn't get to truly sit and go through every bit of info, the amount of mechanics presented was great and provided a great taste of the game. Battles are equally as fun. Being able to play non-scripted battles gave a true feel to how they will progress. Starting in 1914 very much showed how basic your battles will begin and how far they can come by 1918. There is a very obvious progression that will occur on both the campaign map and in battles that I'm excited to, pun intended, dig into. Not everything was peachy perfect though, and a huge reminder that this game is still a work in progress. But clicking on units was often a very big pain, as the apparent unit click box is very specific. The same towards ordering men to their trenches. My biggest frustrations came from these issues, and it often resulted in men dying unnecessarily simply because I couldn't click them to give them orders or direct them to a trench that was right in front of them. My other biggest issue is a lack of grouping. Coordination between groups of soldiers and artillery would be infinitely smoother if I was able to total war it up and group my soldiers. Ordering an artillery strike, then having to drag and select different units, with the unit selection issue in mind, means that several of my charges to enemy lines were botched because I could not select the units quickly enough. Grouping soldiers in this type of RTS is a dead given in 2023, so I hope the devs can see that need and make it happen. The last piece of critique I have is the lack of audio immersion in battles. Too often, it sounds like maybe a dozen men are shooting at each other and not units of 100 plus. Neue Befehle gehen ein. Nehmt den Graben ein! The audio tends to portray a simple skirmish that is pretty laid back and not super intense, rather than a huge trench line battle, and I think that's a miss at the moment. But, overall, I'm still impressed with this game. Does it have the best graphics? Not at all. Is it a paradox level of grand strategy? I really don't think so. But it presents probably one of the best ideas of a World War I game that we have so far from a strategy genre perspective. There is depth, there are unique things that make this title stand out, and I can't wait to see more of the game before it releases on March 30th. Thank you all for watching. Be sure to do all the YouTube things to show your support, including leaving comments in the comments section down below. A big shout out to the members of this channel. You are fantastic, and I appreciate every single one of you. That's all I have for now. This is Havoc, and I'll see you in the next video.